I was born with the very devil in me. I could not help the fact that I was a murderer, no more than a poet could help the inspiration to song, nor the ambition of an intellectual man to be great. The inclination to murder came to me as naturally as the inspiration to do right comes to the majority of persons. H. H. Holmes Today we are going to talk about the man dubbed the first American serial killer. He has been called the devil in the white city. Fingers have been pointed at him as potentially being Jack the Ripper. But what we really know about him is that he was a scam artist, a user, a murderer. I will let you know before we get into anything, there is graphic content in this. Uh, if that's not your thing, I would maybe just wait for the next video. If it is, <laughs> make sure that you give us a like. It definitely helps that channel grow. And let's get into it. He was born Herman Webster Mudgett, May 16th, 1861, in Gilmanton, New Hampshire. Born into an affluent family, much enjoyed a privileged childhood. I was said to be unusually intelligent at an early age. Still, there were haunting signs of what was to come. He expressed an interest in medicine, which reportedly led him to practice surgery on animals. Some accounts indicate he may have been responsible for the death of a childhood friend. At 16, he graduated from Phillips Exeter Academy High School, and soon after, on the 4th of July, 1878, he married Clara Levering in Alton, New Hampshire. Their son, Robert Levering Mudgett, was born on February 3rd, 1880. It sounds as if he was building a normal, potentially prosperous New England life. But Mudgett's life of crime began with various frauds and scams early on. He studied medicine at a small school in Vermont for about a year before leaving that school and being accepted in the University of Michigan Medical School. Housemates at the time described Mudgett as treating Clara violently. And in 1884, before graduation, she moved back to New Hampshire. And later on, she wrote, she knew little of him. As a medical student at the University of Michigan, Mudgett stole cadavers from the laboratory, burned or disfigured them, and planted the bodies, making it look as if they had been killed in an accident. The scandal behind it was that much it would take out insurance policies on these people before planting the bodies, and he'd collect money once the bodies were discovered. Mudgett may have used these bodies for other experiments as well. In 1884, he was nearly prevented from graduating U of M Buena widowed hairdresser accused him of making false promise of marriage to her. He 
he did eventually graduate, although it was said he was a mediocre student at best. In 1885, Mudgett was working a position at a drugstore in Philadelphia. But while he was working there, a boy died after taking medicine that was purchased at the store. Mudgett denied any involvement in the child's death, but he immediately left the city. He fled to Chicago. Soon, he found work in a pharmacy owned by Dr. E.S. Holton. He started using his now infamous alias, Dr. Henry Howard Holmes, most likely to escape any ramifications from the Pennsylvania boy's death. In late 1886, while still married to Clara, Holmes married Myrta Belknap in Minneapolis, Minnesota. They filed for a divorce from Clara a few weeks after marrying Murda, alleging infidelity on her part. But the claims couldn't be proven, and the suit went nowhere. Uh, the surviving paperwork that we have now indicated that she probably was never even informed of the suit. In any case, the divorce was never finalized, and it was dismissed in June of 1891. Holmes had a daughter with Murdo. Her name was Lucy Theodate Holmes. She was born on 4th of July, 1889, in the Englewood area of Chicago. Lucy became a public school teacher later on. Holmes lived with Murdo and Lucy in Wilmette, Illinois, and spent most of his time in Chicago attending to businesses. Holmes married Georgiana Yoke on January 17, 1894, in Denver, Colorado. While still married to both Clara and Murda. Now, the pharmacist owner, Dr. Walton, he was suffering from cancer. And while his wife minded the drugstore. Through his charm, Holmes had manipulated Mrs. Holton into letting him purchase the store. The agreement was that she could still live upstairs in the apartment even after Dr. Holton died. Once Holton died, Holmes allegedly murdered Mrs. Holton and told people that she was visiting relatives in California. As people started to ask questions as when she was going to be coming back, he elaborated the lie even more and told them that she loved it so much in California that she decided to live there. Nobody ever heard from her again, so none of that could be substantiated. After Holmes had become owner of the drugstore, he purchased an empty lot right across the street. He started planning and constructing a three-story building, creating an elaborate house, or one that was eventually called the castle, took up an entire block of 63rd and Wallace Streets in Chicago. During its 1889 construction, Holmes hired and fired several construction crews so that nobody would really have a clear idea of what he was doing. He was designing a murder castle. The ground floor of the castle contained, aside from Holmes' own relocated drugstore, various shops, like a jeweler, for example, while the upper two floors contained his personal office and sleeping quarters, as well as a maze of over a hundred windowless rooms with doorways that would open to brick walls, oddly angled hallways, stairways to nowhere, doors that could only be opened from the outside, and a host of other strange labyrinth-like constructions. 
homes had repeatedly changed the builders during the initial construction, really to decrease the chance of any of them reporting it to the police. After construction was completed in 1891, Holmes placed ads in newspapers offering jobs for young women and advertised the castle as a place of lodging. He also placed ads presenting himself as a wealthy man looking for a wife. Now, all of Holmes' employees and hotel guests, his fiancés, his wives, they were all required to have updated life insurance policies. Holmes would pay the premiums as long as they listed him as the beneficiary. Most of his fiancés and wives would suddenly disappear, as did many of his employees and guests. He had a habit of promising to wed women just prior to their disappearance. People in the neighborhood eventually reported that they saw many women enter the castle and never see any exit. We get to 1893. Chicago was given the honor of hosting the World's Fair, a cultural and social event to celebrate the 400th anniversary of Columbus's discovery of America. The event was going to be scheduled from May through October. It was going to attract millions of people from all over the world. During the 1893 exposition, Holmes called his building the World's Fair Hotel to accommodate tourists who were arriving in droves and opened up his home as a hotel for these visitors. His victims of choice. His visitors of choice. Young female drifters searching for a new exciting life in the big city. And they came. And unfortunately, many of these guests did not survive in what became known as the Murder Castle. In an article written in 1937, the Chicago Tribune described Holmes' murder castle in this way. Oh, what a queer house it was. In all America, there was none other like it. Its chimneys stuck out where chimneys should never stick out. Its stairways ended nowhere in particular. Winding passages brought the uninitiated with frightful jerk back to where they had started from. There were rooms that had no doors. There were doors that had no rooms. A mysterious house it was indeed, a crooked house, a reflex of the builder's own distorted mind. In that house occurred dark and eerie deeds. Now, some of these rooms in Holmes Castle were soundproof. They contained gas lines so that Holmes could asphyxiate his guests whenever he felt like it. There were also trapdoors and chutes that enabled him to move the bodies down to the basement where he could burn the remains in a kiln or dispose of them in other ways. Some were meticulously dissected and stripped of flesh, grafted into skeleton models and then sold to medical schools. Holmes also cremated some of the bodies or placed them in lime pits for destruction. He had two giant furnaces as well as pits of acid, bottles of various poisons, and even a stretching rack. Through the connections he had gained in medical school, he was able to sell the skeletons and organs with really little difficulty. Holmes picked one of the most remote rooms in the castle to perform hundreds of illegal abortions. 
some of his patients died as a result of his abortion procedure, and their corpses were also processed and the skeletons sold. Once the World's Fair had ended, Chicago's economy was in a slump. Holmes took that as a cue to leave Chicago shortly after the fair to continue his schemes, including a plan with an associate named Benjamin Peitzel, in which Peitzel would fake his death to collect $10,000 from a life insurance company. It's, it's back to the bread and butter schemes. Now, around this time, Holmes was traveling a lot, all for his scams. He was actually jailed at one point for another fraud in which he stole horses in Texas, shipped them to St. Louis, and sold them. So he's sitting in jail, and he confided in his, his fellow inmate, and at the time a notorious outlaw, Marion Hedgepeth, who knew Holmes as H.M. Howard, about the life insurance scheme. Uh, they agreed upon release that they'd play out the same scam with Hedgepeth faking his death, similar to Peitzel. Once Holmes was released from jail on bail, he attempted his plan. However, the insurance company was suspicious and didn't pay him. Holmes decided to finish the initial attempt with Peitzel, but this time Holmes actually killed Peitzel. He burned him alive and collected the money for himself. Hedgepath grew angry he wasn't paid for his participation, so he agreed to help investigators by revealing details of their discussion. While the authorities eventually identified Howard as Holmes, they didn't catch on soon enough to stop his final murders. So after Holmes killed Peitzel, he told his widow, Peitzel's widow, that her husband was still alive and in hiding convinced her to let him travel with three out of the five of their children, daughters Alice and Nellie, and his young son, Howard. After several weeks of outrunning authorities, Holmes was finally apprehended in November of 1894. They tracked him to Boston, where they arrested him and held him on an outstanding warrant for the Texas horse swindle. At the time of his arrest, Holmes appeared as if he was prepared to flee the country, and police became suspicious of him. Chicago police investigated Holmes Castle, where they discovered his strange and efficient methods of committing torturous murders. Many of the bodies located were badly dismembered and decomposed. It was hard for them to be determined exactly how many bodies there actually were. During his time in custody with the police, he gave a lot of different stories, once admitting to killing 27 people. The police investigation spread through Chicago, Indianapolis, Toronto. And while conducting their investigation in Toronto, police discovered the bodies of the Peitzel children on July 15th, 1895. Alice and Nellie's bodies were found in a Toronto cellar. Later, 
Authorities found teeth and pieces of bone, among other charred ruins that belonged to Howard in an Indianapolis cottage that Holmes had rented. His link to Holmes in their murders, police had what they needed to arrest him and he was convicted of their murders. So, of Holmes' other assumed victims, um, Julia was allegedly Holmes' lover at one time, and Emmeline was Holmes' former secretary, who he later proposed to. So it's assumed that um, Holmes had killed Julia and her young daughter, Pearl, in 1891. Uh, Emmeline in 1892, and sisters Minnie and Nanny Williams in 1893. Minnie had actually married Holmes. Holmes uh, swindled her out of her inheritance, uh, so he dispatched both his sisters. The bodies of Julio, Emmeline, and Minnie and Annie were never found, but rumor has it Holmes probably sold their cadavers to medical schools. He had consistently stated that Julia and Emmeline died while undergoing illegal abortions, which may have been true, but um, if that was the case, he performed them. While searching Holmes' hotel, authorities recovered Minnie's watch chain and Minnie's garter buckle in one of the ovens. Although forensic evidence was rudimentary at the time, bones found in the basement most likely belonged to 12-year-old Pearl Connor, who he allegedly poisoned. As for Emmeline, the police believed that they had come upon her hair and bones. One account claims that an eyewitness saw Holmes and his janitor haul out a big trunk the day of her disappearance. Through investigations, multiple cities, and through missing persons reports, it's believed that Holmes is responsible for up to 200 murders. He was convicted of the Peitzel murders in 1895, and Holmes appealed his case, but lost just before his execution, Holmes was said to be pleasant and calm, and he only had one request, that his body was to be buried ten feet deep into the ground, with his casket encased in cement, because he didn't want grave robbers to dig his body up and use it for dissection. He died on May 7th of 1896, and he was hanged legally for the Peitzel murder in Moyamensing Prison in Philadelphia. He's buried nearby at Holy Cross Cemetery. The Holmes Murder Castle in Chicago was remodeled as an attraction and named the Holmes Horror Castle. However, it burned to the ground shortly before opening, most likely by Holmes' previous neighbors who didn't want to glorify the atrocities that happened with him. And that is a bit of the story of the devil in the White City. I you enjoyed learning a little bit about this. I hope it wasn't too graphic for you. 
if you're still listening. I definitely appreciate a like. It's helpful for the channel. Make sure you subscribe for more. And I'll see you in the study again.